Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the True Life Podcast. Hope everybody's having a beautiful day. Hope the sun is shining. Hope the new year's treating you well. Hope the birds are singing and the wind is at your back. I've got an incredible individual who doesn't, who doesn't, you might not see him out there a lot, but he's got some interesting ideas. And I think that everybody watching the show today is going to be surprised and thankful that they tuned in. We've got Keith Huffman, a highly accomplished branding expert with over 25 years of experience in building business and creating successful brands in the music, cannabis, and tech industries. As the founder and CEO of Engager Global, an advisory group, Keith specializes in helping cannabis and psychedelic businesses thrive and expand into new markets. With a deep understanding of the cannabis and music industries, he brings a unique and global approach to creating authentic and engaging lifestyle brands. As a co-founder and board member of Heavy Brands, a leading cannabis brand that seamlessly combines music and culture, he has demonstrated his ability to create innovative and captivating brand experience. Keith, thanks for being here today, my friend. How are you? Thanks so much for having me on. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great as well. I, I appreciate your time today. You have a really unique background, man. I was wondering maybe if you could kind of flesh it out a little bit. Like when I start talking about music and culture and cannabis, it's like it's almost like this this triton of this trivium in a way. Like they all kind of go together, man. How did you get all mixed up in this? So yeah, it goes back to my college days. Actually, I um, was working at a at the college radio station. Um, I was always a huge music lover uh, growing up. My mother was a musician. She uh, she played flute, and I learned music at a early age, and just kind of fell into the whole music scene where where I went to school and started promoting concerts and working at the college radio station, and. Um, on the side, uh, I was, you know, help, able to sort of supplement my uh, my college income uh, through, uh, you know, I had a buddy that, you know, lived down in Arizona. You know, I went to school in, in Michigan and um, we, uh, we would get, you know, it's kind of funny when I think back on it, like these paint cans uh, full of uh, full of amazing, uh, you know, this fire weed from Arizona. And so for me, you know, look, cannabis and music and just culture, going back to those days has always kind of been a part of my life. And then when I uh, started my career in New York City, uh, I, I worked in the music industry there and worked with a lot of different, you know, really amazing different, you know, creatives and just seeing how those creatives use cannabis, you know, in a variety of different ways to either spark their their creativity or, um, you know, use it as a medicine for a variety of different reasons. So it's interesting. Uh, now kind of came full circle. Uh, I live in California, came out here to kind of work and do a bunch of things in the tech and media space, started a media company that was focused on the cannabis industry. And then started creating some of my own brands. And sure enough, most of my brands ended up being sort of music centric, music focused brands. So, um, yeah, it's just it's just kind of it just naturally for me, it just always is part of that, you know, uh, that that music tribe is, you know, cannabis and, and plant based medicines in general have just always been a part of that. I love it. It's always intriguing to me to see like the life cycle of a business, especially it's and especially in the plant medicine business, it's almost like you can see the seed to the fruit in someone's ideas. Like you talk about in the beginning, you have these paint cans and you guys are figuring this stuff out. You're on this scene. And then all of a sudden, like maybe that's the seed. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in cannabis, like blooming a little bit. Like it's a really unique way and I think a great metaphor to see our lives and I got to think that being involved in plant medicine helps you see that that metaphor better and probably helps you brand things better. Maybe you can talk about the relationship between like cannabis, your relationship with cannabis and how it sees you, how you see yourself in culture. I think that there's got to be something in there. Well, for me, uh, I've I've had a relationship with the plant, you know, it, it, and it served me in a variety of different ways over, over the years. Um you know, my relationship with it today is very different than it was when I first started. You know, it was started off being 
certainly much more part of my more recreational like you know lifestyle and then it became once i started to learn all of the amazing benefits of it um you know uh, medicinal benefits and how certain you know uh strains or you know uh, or delivery methods kind of serve me in different ways um for me i have always looked at you know in, in general for me when i've did brands you know because that's that's one of the things i've always been involved in sort of the intellectual property side of things whether it be in music whether it be in canvas um you know i've always seen an opportunity to build to build brands so you're right you know if you look at if you look at a brand, um you know it's very it's very much like a plant right you know you've, you've got to plant it you know you got to put it in the ground but before you even put it in the ground you got to know what it is you want to grow right and i think that that's one thing that i find a lot of brands these days they kind of come out they try to they try to skip the steps you know they 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 they, they try to go where you know and i saw this at you know one of my first cannabis you know media companies we had an in-house agency and we had worked on over 60 different brand projects and so often people would come in to us and say, hey, we need help with our brand. And we're like, okay, great. Uh, who's your target audience? And like already, like that already instantly, like, well, well, people smoke weed or everyone, or maybe, you know, they would have this conception of like connoisseurs. But the way you ever, if you're going to create a brand in, and it doesn't matter what industry you're talking about, if you don't, start with who it is you're trying to delight super serve who is your tribe who is your audience and if you don't plant that seed with them in mind then you're already put yourself at a disadvantage because you're kind of going out and you're skipping all these steps by just going out with your own preconceived notion as to what you think that audience wants and what that brand should say to them so it, there are a lot of analogies you need to know what seed you're planting and then you need to nurture that as you're growing the brand and building it from the, the 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 you know planting the seeds having the roots take take hold and then as a as a as a as a you know each age of 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 it you know comes to fruition you're continuing to nurture it in a way so that you get those those the nice you know and at the end of it um or whatever it is you're growing you know whatever plant it is that flower um that it actually uh resonates and in works for the the end purpose which you know in this case as a brand is you have a brand that actually means something you know and it's a, it's an authentic connection to your audience that's really well said i i love the idea and I want to dig a little deeper on this idea of an authentic connection. On some level, do you think that when building a, we'll just say a cannabis brand, like the, it's imperative to have lived experience in using cannabis in order to thoroughly understand how to market it. Like if you have a relationship with something, you have lived experience in it, then it makes sense that you will be able to have a unique way to market it because you have your own relationship with it. The same way you may have your own unique relationship with your partner, you know how that particular relationship can work. But when it comes to business, you're trying to share your unique relationship with this plant with a wider audience. Like maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Like I, I think you really have to know the thing that you're in relationship with if you want to share the beauty of it to other people because you're really trying to get them to see different angles of it and things like that. Does that kind of make sense? It does. Look, I mean, uh, I've seen some successful uh, cannabis brands built by people that um, for a variety of different reasons are not um, consumers. So I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily like fully adhere to the, you have to, you know, be a user. However, what I would adhere to is you have to have people on your team that do right like because at the end of the day there's just this if you're going to build what you you're right this authentic connection then it's um there's just things that you're going to inherently know that will authentically connect 
uh, what makes sense, what works, what doesn't work. You know, if you're going to speak to that audience and in a cannabis audience, then yes, you need, if it's not you, it needs to be, you know, the people on your team that um, fully just kind of feel in their bones, right? That, that you know, kind of what, what works and what doesn't work. And we look at the end of the day, I think what, you know, you're trying to get at here, George, is like, look, at the end of the day, consumers, they see through the bullshit, right? Like, yeah. they, you know, when we talk about authenticity, um, you know, hey, it's it's a reason why a lot of celebrity brands, you know, for instance, don't work, right? Because just slapping a celebrity's name on a, on a package and maybe having them do a photo shoot, you know, people get right through that, you know, like I, I've saw, like, I'll never forget, like um, I was at MJ BizCon, this must've been four or five years ago. And there was a brand who I, who I will not name, who trotted out Gene Simmons from Kiss as their <laughs> spokesperson, right? Well, anyone who knows Gene Simmons, he's like, he was kind of like an anti-drug guy. Like he was like a hardcore, like he, he did not consume, right? It's like, like either these people didn't do their homework on this guy or or whatever, but like obviously that brand did not work, right? Like that connection because it's like if there is not a meaningful like connection between who that celebrity is or who that person is directly to the audience, then you know, like it's all you have right now is your reputation, right? It's all you have. If you're going to build any brand in any industry and in anything, if you are not true to your audience, you're not speaking their language, you're not living in their world, it's just not going to work. Yeah, it's well said. It's, you know, it, another area that I, that I'm fascinated by with cannabis too, is this, I think it's a fine line between like inspiration and enhancement. And I think that those kind of walk hand in hand in some ways. Like I, I think that you can be inspired by cannabis use, but you can also have an enhanced sort of thinking process from it. You know, maybe that's a strain. Maybe that has to do with your body chemistry. I don't thoroughly have it figured out with the cannabinoid system and all that stuff. But it seems to me that not enough people are talking about cannabis as a mind enhancement sort of a tool. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, look, I, I've been in plenty of uh, cr creative uh, places. I've had tons of, I, you know, I wish, I wish I was more creative. I grew up, I learned, I learned how to use. There's a reason why I became a business person and a branding person uh, and was not a musician uh and was not or was not an artist and i but i relate to to creatives i've grown up and i've worked with creatives my entire life and i find that you know certainly uh the creatives that i've worked with uh have a have stronger relationships with the plants than many many others do. like for instance at my at one of my last companies i we had a media company uh, we had close to 80 employees at our at our peak, Whoa. and um, we weren't one of those. I mean, obviously, we were a cannabis media company, so we didn't have like, oh, you know, you can't smoke on the job or consume the job. However, we did require that you actually perform on the job. So what we found in general, and and I'm honestly the same way. Like for me, like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna consume, it's generally after hours because I find that it takes my brain into a more creative space. However, the people that I encourage to, to consume were creatives, our art team, our, our creative team, and they thrived in that, right? And because it was an enhancer for them, right? It was, it, it inspired ideas, it allowed them to get more creative. And it also uh, took off, I think, for a lot of creatives, it kind of, it, it it kind of like helps them to think outside of the box, right? You know, you're not necessarily if uh, you're not necessarily confined into a, a very defined space. Um, now, when I'm doing spreadsheets and working on numbers, like I have to be in those defined spaces. And if I 
if I, uh, if I consume, like I'm, I'm not very effective, but, um, but yes. So I, I have always seen it, whether, you know, kind of going back to my music days, you know, a, a lot of the most creative moments that I witnessed in the studio were, you know, certainly right after a sesh, you know, where right. people were, you know, had come off and like, all right, let's go out jam. And it's like, okay. Whereas they may have been reaching um, some challenges about kind of where to go next with a, with a piece of music, you know, a lot of times it was after those sessions that something kind of unlocked, right? Or it just it flowed out of that. Um, and I think, you know, speaking of flow, that's a word where this flow state, right? That that people and athletes and and artists and creatives get into i think cannabis helps people a lot of people get into that state you know much more easily it's so amazing that you bring up flow state like and i gotta uh i'm i'm piloting this new thing called a soul compass by susan brown's company and it measures your flow state and one of their biggest targets for pilots are musicians because musicians find themselves in that flow state all the time and it's I think that there's something there and I think cannabis and maybe plant medicines does play a role in getting into that flow state, whether you call it a flow state, a creative moment, thinking outside the box, there's something about cannabis and plant medicine that allows us to see reality in a way that is different. And sometimes that difference can show itself in a medicinal fashion where people with PTSD can use it and get away from a problem. Some people can use it to be more creative, but what do you think is that relationship between like, what is it for you? Like when you have, you, you spoke about having a session and coming off that session, having these different thoughts in your mind if in an, or just in your opinion, what, what is happening? Are you seeing yourself from like a third person point of view, or is there a way in which you can explain the different mindset you have when you're in the flow state or when you're in that relationship with cannabis? Well, I think it depends on the situation. You know, right. a lot of, for, for at least for my personal experiences, a lot of uh, environment has, has, has a lot to do with, with what the, the experience is as much as anything, right? It's like right. if you're just by yourself, your experience is very different than if you're a room where you're building off what everyone else is, you know, kind of flow, you know. And you get that strength in numbers, right? Where it's like you start to kind of get more of a more of an in energy that you know combined is way more powerful than than you're able to have on your own. And I personally prefer that type of an experience because what I find is sometimes when I'm just alone, sometimes you just kind of get caught up in your own head, right? And in like in the cannabis. Sometimes it's beneficial. Sometimes it is, you know, because sometimes it's taking you, you, your brain's taking you a place that maybe isn't as, as, as where you, you, you are going to get your most creative. So for me personally, you know, again, and I think the thing about all plant, plant-based, you know, medicines is that some of it is because we haven't, ha we don't have a ton of research on it still. Um, you know, we don't really know that everybody's experience is very different, you know? Um, and, and, um, so, you know, I don't think there's really that sort of one size fits all personally. I can say I've never had sort of a, a third person type of experience through cannabis. Um, have had that experience through other plant medicines for sure. Um, but not cannabis for, per se. Um, so, you know, look, I think it, it just comes down to, everybody has to find out kind of find that place that that works for them right and um and kind of cannabis is i like to look at it as like look it, it if it's not serving you a way that enhancing you then then you're better off not you know because look I, I know plenty of people that uh cannabis more anxious you know it kind of it, it, it kind of it's not you know it's not a one size fits all right and it's 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 type of solution however i also do know you know i love coming back to the music because for yeah. me like i'm just a music person but some of the most seminal like music works of all time were created 
with the enhancements of of cannabis or other plant-based medicines you know and it's like like we wouldn't have those works of art without it you know and and honestly back in time like if you go back and you look at the history of civilizations and you right. see and they're starting to discover now more and more where they found you know uh, you know use cases of where um you know it, there is evidence that plant-based medicines were used in ancient civilizations, right? And and you know that it's the healers and it's the it's the it's the musicians, it's the the creatives that were have been using these for, for since the beginning of mankind, since they discovered what the the benefits of the, of these are. And so, yeah, um, I'm. I don't even remember now, George, exactly what your first question was, original question was. But hopefully I, uh, in my roundabout way, uh, shed some light on it. Yeah, not only did you shed some light on it, but I think you're, you've are you perked some other questions that I have percolating in my mind. And that is this idea, you know, when, when we look at ceremony and healing, it's often accompanied by music. And most people can understand the healing power of music. And that... That is just a stepping stone. And in, in, in some ways, it's the ceremony, it's the healing power of plants, and it's the music that can lead to an incredible brand because a brand is symbolic of a time. And if you have music like da 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 by Menon or or da 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 da, I'm loving it. Like there's always this little bit of music that comes with the word that synthesizes together that leaves a symbol in your mind to remember that brand. And I don't love the way some large corporations hijack that and put this crappy thing in your head that you have to remember forever, you know, but I'm not saying it's not effective. It's really effective. And mm -hmm. what I want to talk about is the reason why it's so effective. And I think cannabis, plant medicine, music, and healing are three things that implant in us and make us remember things. It's almost ceremonial. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the idea of branding and why it works, why these things together work in a way and they leave a residence, they leave a residue in people's minds. Maybe you could talk about branding and, and, and those things that come with it. Yeah, well, look, we're, we're, you know, we have five senses, right? And, and, and each of those senses, when they're triggered, they trigger a memory, right? So it's like, you know, that's a certain, certain songs like elicit an emotion from you that is very personal right because if there's a song that reminds you of something you know either a, an amazing time or, or a tragic experience or whatever it may be it's amazing how that hearing that song again will instantly take you back to that to that moment right it's just uh in Look, it's it's similar to smells too. Like right. can do the same thing, right? And and all different kinds of your your five senses. But I think in particular auditory that that music certainly, um, at least for me, is is extremely strong. I think it's why I was drawn to get into music to begin with, right? Because for me, yeah. it's just like I am drawn to the auditory sense, right? I love I love music. I love I love experiencing new kinds of, of music and new uh, new sounds. Um, I, you know, I'm a bit more experimental than most, just because I I'm constantly am looking for 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 new kinds of sounds, new kinds of experiences. And so for me, as it relates into building brands, um, you know, I the reason why I built the the cannabis brands that I built, I built around music is because to me uh people that listen to certain kinds of music in particular it's it's a very tribal experience at the end of the day right it's like these are my people like so our first brand was was a brand called heavy and it was a, a a brand focused on the hard rock heavy metal audience because that audience is so like devoted to their music and their scene right it's like like they wear their they wear their uh, their music case out. They you know they they are very open about it. You go to a hard rock heavy metal uh, festival or concert, and that communal spirit there is 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 just it's thriving. You know, and it's and 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 I also will say, 
there's all cannabis at those events, you know, <laughs> like, you know, I haven't been to a heavy metal concert where there wasn't, weren't wafts of smoke, um, you know, kind of going, going up and, and, and out there. But, you know, look, every, every tribe is looking for their, is, is like their, their go-to brand. Right. And, and so each of these people, their brands in some instances is the band. Right. But what we found is that this, the heavy metal tribe didn't have a cannabis brand. Right. Like there wasn't like, this is my weed brand, you know? Yeah. And so whenever we would show up at these festival events with the big weed leaf, the lines would be around the corner because people were like, what is going on here? And like, and, and it was incredible because people would come up and they're like, oh my God, I've been waiting my whole life for this. <laughs> There's a weed brand that actually, that actually speaks to me. Like, this is amazing. And so like, that's the whole thing, man. It's like, that's when you know you've nailed something, right? Is when you get that kind of a response from someone, right? Where they're literally coming up and saying to you, I've been waiting for you, right? And, and you're like, okay, we're, we're onto something here. And uh, so I, I believe that, you know, if, if you're going to build a brand the right way, that all of the different elements uh, need to be in place. And for me, it's like, whether it's like you're focused just on a music audience, like for me, that was just a natural because I worked in music, I've worked in cannabis. It's like that intersection was just a natural one for me. But I do think like, even if you're not going after an explicit music focused audience, how you use music as part of your overall sort of brand building campaign is something I think is pretty underutilized. Um, people in general, when they're building the brands, aren't really thinking about, again, like what we started talking about, how music triggers them to think about your brand, right? Mm -hmm. And if yeah. you are able to connect all those dots in a way that it holistically kind of comes together and works together, then um, then you've got a winner there, right? Because then then it's like, oh, they hear this either style of music or this song that remembers like, oh yeah, it was me to go get go to the dispensary. You know, I know that I need like, oh yeah, I need some more of my medicine. Um, so you just never know what it's gonna trigger. But to me, it all kind of it all works when you do it the right way, it all works together seamlessly pearls my friend there's a pearls in there thank you for that it's yeah it brings up the idea of contagion when building a brand you want it to be contagious like how do you build contagion into brands <laughs> let me just give you an easy question here <laughs> well look i mean i think contagion uh it's interesting i hadn't actually heard, you know thought about it in yes. that way before but it's it's really look contagion virality Ooh, um, are you building a uh, are you are you building a painkiller or or, or, or <laughs> maybe or a vitamin? Medicine. yeah you know um, it's there's all these different ways to look at it but it's it, it's a, it's at the end of the day it kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier which is you've got to look at who your audience is and then work backwards from there because mm. whatever it is that you're presenting to them, you know, whether it's your product, the product itself, right. Does, you know, what I see in cannabis a lot is that, and this is what kind of going back to where I was saying, talking about, we learned a lot when I, when I had my agency is when people came in as I need help with my brand. Well, they had already, they came in with fully realized products, right. And then they needed a logo to put on the box that they could get on shelves, right? Like that's what they thought a brand was. Well, really, if you were truly creating a brand the right way, what you would have done is before you created your products, you would have said, who is my target audience and what products make sense for that audience? How can I build the best version of that product for that audience? Then what is the brand story? that I need to kind of build around that so that this resonates with this audience. And how do I make my target audience the hero of that story, right? And then when you're when you're starting to build it up layer by layer like this, 
then you're building in your natural like contagion and virality because you're building this in such a way that if you do this correctly, then you're becoming an integral part of that of that person's life, right? Where like they can't live without you, right? Because if you've done this and you've built this in foundationally into a way that they're like, I, I can't imagine a life without this brand. That's when you know you've 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 nailed it and you've got the contagion. But it's got to be built into the, the you know built into the DNA, built into the roots, whatever analogy you wanna you wanna use. It has to be there from the start. It has to be part of the foundation because if it's not, you can't just slap it on later on and 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 think it's going to work the same way. Um, you know, maybe you'll get lucky and and you'll strike lightning in a bottle, but m for the most part, the brands that I've seen have true success are the ones that built it for an audience from the start, and they didn't stray from that, right? right. And they they didn't like try to, you know, that's the other thing too is too many too many brands try to they try to speak to everyone, you know, or they try to like be all things to all people. And that to me is a, is a, is a, is a recipe for disaster because it's like, you need to speak to your one core target audience and super serve them and become a part of their everyday life. And once you've done that, then what the, the way that you expand out is then you start to hit that ass, you become of that that more like the halo effect of like oh i think these this guy's really cool and he's you know right this is his brand so maybe that should be my brand too right you start to tap into that aspirational element of things but you won't be able to do that if you don't take take care of the core first right if you don't hit that target audience you become a part of them because at the end of the day when it comes to evangelizing your brand right marketing your brand there's no better uh sort of that than than your your consumers themselves right it's like you know you, you yeah that's uh and that's when you know that you've you've truly become because you've you've you know getting back to your contagion you know you've yeah. you've hooked them in whatever that virus is or the contagion and they want to spread it Right. And and then that's when you've got something really powerful. Yeah, I love it. It, it reminds me of um, like the story of Airwalk. And I'm probably showing my age here, you know, but when I was coming up as a kid, you could buy really sick Airwalk shoes, but you could only get them like at surf shops or skate shops. And they were super hot for like a long time. And then all of a sudden they started selling to like Macy's and, and Nord's. They started selling to like Sears. They started just they just they just said, you know what, we're cashing in everybody. Everybody can buy them now. And as soon as they did that, like they lost the cool factor and the people that were their core were like, we're done, you know, but it's, I think it speaks to that idea, which you were talking about. Like you've built your core, you have this incredible engine that's driving your idea forward and they're all part of it. They're all in man. And then you give it away. <laughs> well, look, I mean, everyone's got their reasons, you know, and it's called the, the, the sellout, right. You know, um, Hey, you know what? there's a place on that thing. Right. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I would never like, I would never, um, you know, begrudge any, any, any company or brand owner that, you know, decides the time is right or, the, right or whatever their own personal family reasons. Right. But they do lose, you do lose it. Right. Once you, once you do kind of quote unquote sell out, you're not getting that back. Right. It's like, cause once you've lost, they're already on to the next sort of yeah. authentic and you know, a cool thing that, it's tough. I mean, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of, uh, and I'm a big believer in intellectual property, but you know, right. I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of companies come in and buy IP rights for companies thinking that they can revitalize that brand. And they have a real tough time, you know, cause once a brand is kind of taking a downturn, it's it, it, in some ways it may even be harder than starting with a completely new brand. Right. Because you have all the all you have all the baggage, right? You have everything that's kind of like you have to overcome. There's a reason why this has fallen off. So now you have to build this thing back up in a way that you know brings it back. And people like are thinking, well, but they already 
the name's known, right? And so that's the hard thing is I want people just to know the name. Yeah, but if the name's known for the wrong reasons, then you're kind of setting yourself up for a tough, a tough road to hoe, man. It's like that's uh I I personally, you know, would rather start start fresh than than try to take a kind of an old dead brand and 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 revitalize it. Is there some similarities and differences between, say, like an artist or like a, a band that's their own brand versus a product that's their own band? Like it seems like they both have different ups and downs and they can come back and they can get burned and they can be hot. Are there are there some similarities and some differences? And if so, what, what might those be? There are definitely lots of similarities. I mean, I do look at, um, you know, one of the ways that's putting together my portfolio of brands is because I came from the music industry, I looked at almost like building my roster, right? With right, my totally. band, you know, yeah. my brands. And so I do think, look, a, a band or an artist represents something. They are a brand. Mm. Uh, now, there are, there, there are very important differences, though, because at the end of the day, those artists are arts. And so... It's a lot easier for an artist to reinvent themselves right. and to come across as authentic than it is for a kind of a brand to do that. Because right? a brand, it's uh, it's not a person. It's not a personality. It's right. not someone like people can sense. Like if if a, one one of my favorite one of my favorite music artists of all time is David Bowie. You know, and he reinvented himself consistently, and it always worked, right? Because it was truly him, right? He, he was authentically being himself at that moment, right? Of like, this is who my artistic self is today. And you love it or hate it, you have to, you have to admire it, right? Or take it for, you know, right. and he is his commercial success ebbed and flowed over the years, but he was always true to his, himself. And so I think an artist can kind of overcome having some like you know, oh, well, that artist fell off. Well, there's a lot of stories where art, there's the comeback album, right? right. Where, where the artists, I think it's a lot easier for an artist to do a comeback album than it is for a brand to have a comeback album. It's a great point. Um, another one of my, another one of the fascinating brand stories you hear is in Steve Jobs' book, his biography by Walter Isaacson. And Walter Isaacson asks him, you know, can you tell me, Steve, about the the ebb and flow of businesses and why so many businesses, so many brands that are on top of the world, they end up just they just die later in life. And he had a really cool answer. You're probably aware of it. But the answer is in the beginning, a brand or a company has a has like a founder and they have a, a lot of the times something has a they have a visionary that everybody believes in. And this person is larger than life and they get people to believe in this idea. But then all of a sudden the marketing team begins to move the needle more than the visionary. And when that begins to happen and the company's public, all of a sudden the marketing team becomes the people that move the needle. So they get moved up to the different positions of authority and influence and the visionary sometimes gets pushed back out. Is that, is that something that you agree with that you see happening in, in a lot of the corporations today or in branding in general? Absolutely. Uh, I just saw a great, uh, a really fascinating documentary, uh, on jewel uh on netflix man i highly recommend it yeah because you know the the that founding team they had really uh the best of intentions you know to, to create a safer way for people to consume tobacco right they really that that was their vision and that's what they they, they wanted to do well then when they they took in a bunch of took in a bunch of vc money you know because they were they were you know, Stanford dads, and they kind of were in that Silicon Valley scene, there was the pressure to kind of turn this into a product that, you know, we're going to have a bit, you know, that was going to kind of come out of the gate, like, you know, uh, gangbusters. So they hired some marketing people that created this, this, this marketing campaign that was very much about how Jewel was for the cool kids. And it was, and basically it was a campaign that that went directly and resonated directly with children you know and mm. underage and and so that's kind of where that whole jewel sort of ep ep epidemic kind of started because like the marketing was so successful that all these kids were like oh my god there's a there's a 
there's a way that I can just like even smoke in class, you know, and all this thing. And it's the cool kids know it. And when you kind of drop in jewel, like, you know, it's like you're, you're kind of speaking the secret language. Well, it got so far away, right? Because the founder of that company, when it was just them driving it, they were able to bring in some amazing talent. They had this, they built this vision of this team and, you know, these guys didn't even have a chance because they made a huge misstep out the gate. So anyway, I, I, I do believe in, in everything that, that, uh, that Steve Jobs was alluding to there because look, you see it all the time now, right? It's, it's always challenging, challenging though, because, you know, like, depending on who that founder is, you know, they, they can become polarizing sometimes, you know, I think you're starting to see this now with someone like Elon Musk, right. Yeah. Where, um, when he was the visionary behind Tesla and SpaceX and his different companies, um, it was a powerful driver for those companies, right? His, his, his personal brand was a powerful driver. Well, when he took over X, and uh, really started to be very vocal, you know, on that. He, it started to kind of have an impact negatively on some of those, you know, you know, companies, brands, right? Because not everyone necessarily uh, agrees with all of his viewpoints on X and all of his, the ways that he's kind of used that platform for a variety of different things. And it's, it's really fascinating to me because yeah. like, whether you love him or hate him, he's a, he's like, he's built some incredible businesses. Right. And I think that it's, um, it's just interesting because at what point do you, um, you know, and Steve jobs was like, he's like, he was a unicorn, right? Let's face it. Like that guy, like everyone's like, Oh, I'm going to be the Steve jobs of this. And like, man, Steve jobs was like a one of a kind, like that guy, we were, fortunate to have him in in um you know in our generation or in our you know in our lifetimes to have had an experience in because i worked in the music industry so just a quick kind of side note like you know he he revolutionized the music industry right because at that time like i took over digital business um at at bmg uh right at the time when i took it over it was under a million in revenue uh as a digital business because there were no real meaningful business models at the time the only uh music digital music services were actually run by the music companies and they weren't successful and steve jobs basically came in and he said look people don't want to be forced to, have to buy albums because at that time you still had to buy the bundle yeah. you had to buy right. if you wanted to buy music digitally you had to buy it's like look people don't want to buy that way they want to buy it. They want to buy the songs they want. That's all they want. And you have to unbundle. And that was a big battle. Yep. And he's like, and he won that battle and, you know, he changed the way that music served. And it was, you know, that whole music industry worked and it was, um, fortunately it didn't go so well for the music industry because they didn't actually, um, you know, part of the reason I left is that it, it they, they didn't listen to the consumers. Like, like right. they didn't, they didn't provide, um, you know, for me, it was like, oh my God, look at all this. You looked at what was happening with like Napster and things like that, right? Where it's like, look right. at all this pent up demand that's not being fulfilled. And, you know, we've got the opportunity for, and Stop saw that, right? Right. And, and yep. he, um, so, anyway, I, I, getting back to your original point, yes, I agree uh, wholeheartedly that. Uh, the, bar, the the further away that these companies get from a lot of the founding teams or the founders, then the harder it is for them to continue to be to be a meaningful brand, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah it, it's, a, it's a fascinating subject, man. It's because it yeah, can it go is. in so many different directions. I love it, and it's so it's so interesting. On some level, like once you get that big, you just don't have. The only way to grow is to buy other people that have what you had, you know, and in some ways you can the same way that a guy in his sixties wants to be together with a girl in his twenties. So too does a big brand want to buy the younger brand. Cause they still want to have like that. They still want to feel cool, man. They still want to feel like they're needed. They still want to feel like, look, I still got it. No, you don't, man. You don't got it anymore, but go gracefully, you know, find a way to, to tell your story or something else like that. I, 
you know what? I'm kind of excited. Like I, I see right now the same way that, you know, Apple came out with its 1984 commercial and disrupted IBM. It's so beautiful to see these young bucks on the scene right now getting ready to, to in my opinion, disrupt some of the platforms. Like I think, I think Google, I think Amazon, I think uh, even Apple, I think some of these platforms, like they've just lost the ability. Like they don't know, they have so much, they don't know what to do. You know, they, and, and you see these young ideas coming up with like, uh, you know, hey, maybe we could build a better network where everybody gets a percentage of the sale. And all of a sudden these new ideas are beginning to percolate a little bit. And I, I don't know, I, I, I have a fondness for the big brands. Like I'm so stoked on what they did for us. Like I don't want people to forget that. Like they, they changed the way we, we kind of were able to do commerce and that's a beautiful thing. But it's just interesting to see the cycle kind of, kind of moving forward and to, to be at an age where you be like, oh, I remember when this happened or I remember when this happened, you know, it's, um, what are some things that you're excited about for branding at, at this point in time? For me, I am starting to get a lot more involved in uh, some AI initiatives. So, I mean, I know that's kind of a generic sort of thing, but for me in general, uh, so I've spent a lot of time uh, in Latin America. I'm, I'm a big believer in, in, in being a global citizen, in bringing, in helping to support and educate uh, people all over the world. So I've, I, I launched a, uh, an education platform for uh, business leaders in the cannabis industry. And I did it uh, personally in both English and in Spanish. And it's interesting. So I, it took me an hour and a half to do the, uh, to do the English version of my first course. And it took me six and a half hours to do it in Spanish because my Spanish, I'm like kind of intermediate, high intermediate level, but not completely fluent. And so my business partners, I, I'm working with uh, one of the largest uh, education platforms in, in Latin America. They're like, well, we're still going to put subtitles on this. And I was so bummed. I'm like, no, man, I want to, I don't want people to be distracted by subtitles. So I took, I took a class to, to uh, a former business partner of mine who had an AI company. I was like, can you see what you can do with this? And he came back something that just blew me away and it actually spawned a whole new business um it's called language hub uh languagehub.ai we've launched this business where basically any talking head uh content we can use your voice we can sync your lips and your body gesture and have you speak in just about any language and so i'm now launching all of my educational platform in multiple languages uh, using this AI uh, technology, which is incredible because to me, it helps bring the world, make the world a smaller place, right? It allows my reach to uh, to get out there. So for example, George, we could we could take all of your content and we could we could create it into, you know, we could do different versions. We could do French versions, do Spanish versions, and you can exponentially I mean your audience, you know, through this, through this technology. So for me, I think there's just some amazing ways to kind of use AI to increase brands reach. So for me, I look at AI as an accelerator yeah. for brands, you know, and ways yep. for brands, personal brands or brands of any sort to take their content and, and kind of go global. Cause I'm a, I'm a very big believer in creating global brands. And so for me, the only way that you can do that is you have to be, you know, you can have a global vision, but you have to be local in your approach. And you can't be local in your approach if you're not communicating in the local language. And so now AI allows you to do that. And so that's, that's a, so to me, that's what I'm excited about. You know, it's not so much that it's a brand per se, but it's, right. a, it's a way to kind of use these new technologies in ways for whatever brand you do have to reach a larger audience in a way that again it's authentic because you're able to kind of communicate with them in their in their language so that's that's something i'm excited about right now man that makes me excited about it that's a freaking cool idea man i can't i'm, I'm gonna totally hit you up because i would love to do that with some of my content it brings up this other idea i'm thinking about too is that you know, we spoke a little bit about like the exclusivity coolness. Like we talked about Airwalk and, and Apple has its own exclusivity for a while. It sounds like what you're talking about with AI, it's, it's flipping that on its head. Hey, we're going to make it awesome for everybody. 
Like, you know, that's a really cool way to change the world. It's like, hey, it's not just about this small group being cool. We're going to make it cool for everybody. I kind of get goosebumps when I think about that, man. That's awesome. Well, it's at minimum, it allows you to reach it, – it allows you to reach that same tribe in every country, right? Okay, um, way better and, said. Way better said. And, and you know, it's not necessarily – you know, because look, at the end of the day, you know, if you're going to have it's that gets back to that authenticity question. Yep. It's like if, you know, I'll, like, let's let's talk about the music example of of the uh, heavy grass is, is one of my brands that's focused on the hard rock and metal audience. Well, that audience is there's, there's no geographic borders, right, for, <laughs> for that audience. Right. It's right. not like, oh, just because you live in Brazil um you know that you wouldn't be a fan of this you know cannabis brand that's focused on your audience but um right now because of the regulatory infrastructure of ways that you can you can you know kind of have any sort of international commerce it's impossible for me to send my my cannabis brands directly to brazil today however there's ways that you can launch cannabis brands in any country even if you're just launching with the lifestyle brand to start with right so you're starting with maybe it's just apparel and merch and accessories maybe it's cbd products whatever it may be um you know that same hard rock heavy metal audience is in brazil they're in argentina they're in colombia they're in all these different places they're in europe and so now um you know, that's always been my approach is that I want to build brands that have a global audience and I want to figure out ways to reach that audience using whatever tools are available to me. Right now, AI is a pretty interesting and cool tool to, to, to use uh, to reach those audiences. Yeah, man, it's it's trailblazing in some ways. And I, I'm so excited to see people embrace it and use it as an accelerator because in some ways it's so liberating. It, it really allows good ideas to win. And it, it's, it's like giving someone their own think tank in a way, you know, depending on which what you're using or who you're teaming up with. But it, it really excites me for the future to see the way in which AI is helping us learn how to communicate not only our ideas, but meaning. It seems to me like there's a it's really helping us understand what's meaningful in life. But is that too much to say? Or what do you think about that? I, no, I agree. I mean, look, and I think, but it, it cuts both ways too, right? There's, um, yes. it's unfortunately, you know, nefarious, you know, uh, uh, you know, individuals out there that are going to use these things, um, you know, the wrong reasons, you know, like right. I'm, I'm all about bringing people together, right? That's just my, that's just kind of who I am. I've always yeah. been like a uniter I built in communities and, and, you know, to me, I have, you know, always have the best of intentions, uh, you know, but, you know, the fact that you can use AI, you know, just speaking about the language side of it, you know, um, you know, the, <laughs> and I, and I, and I, you know, it, it kind of, it kind of, it scares the hell out of me, honestly, like what's going to happen in this next election cycle because of the way that you can use the deep fakes, right? Right. To kind of have people like, how do you tell the difference, right? Like whether or not that person actually said right. it or not, you know? And so it's, uh, it's a little bit scary too. I choose to look at the positive, you know, I choose to embrace, I choose to, um, I try, I choose to bring positivity to the world. That's just kind of the, that's just the only way I know, uh, to, to, to kind of, kind of approach, uh, co approach technology. So I've never been afraid. I've always been one of those, when you talk about trailblazers, um, I, unfortunately, um, I'm typically uh, too early on most things because I, because I'm like, kind of one of those people that always, you know, kind of sees things before there's an actual market for it or, you know, or consumer adoption uh, for, for things. But it's, it's what interests me and it's the ways like to kind of help sometimes. Yeah. It's a little, it's a little challenging sometimes to be one of the pioneers where you're taking all the arrows, right. You know, the trailblazers, you know, took the arrows. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, uh, but, but, you know, look, it's also the way that we're, we're able to kind of help to, to kind of show what's possible, right? And 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 kind of start to 
you know, because because a lot of times as I'm sure you've seen, you know, it happens with a lot of brands uh, yeah. in general. A lot of times the most successful brands weren't the first, you know, uh, they were the ones that kind of kind of just were able to see, OK, well, these guys kind of tried to do this and they weren't successful, but maybe the timing just wasn't right or they tried. Maybe this approach wasn't quite right for this. And then they came in and kind of took it to the next level. And I think that that's part of the iterative process of creativity, right? It's like music. What are you talking about? Music, music, music is always built on what before, it, right? And like people yeah. will say, oh, well, that's stealing. Well, it, you know, look, no, like what truly original thoughts are there out there, right? Like what truly original like music is out there? What truly original brands are there out there? They're all just creations built upon what's already existing and kind of taking it to and adding your own little special sauce to it and secret sauce that kind of helps yeah. give it its unique qualities and take, help takes it to the next level. Yeah. There's a lot in there, man. Like I, you know, being really early looks a lot like being really wrong. <laughs> you know, like I've been there a few times. I've been like so dumb. And then a year later being like, Jesus Christ, I was a genius, you know? <laughs> It just being so ashamed, like I didn't go stay. But you, you can't control that. Like you should be blessed and thankful that you had the time and that you were really, you were really early. Being like, I, I love the slings from the Trailblazer. Another one is the first one over the wall is probably gonna get clobbered, you know. But like, I love all those metaphors because I, I felt like I've, I've, I've been the first one over the wall a few times. And another point that I, that you just spoke to that's kind of near and dear to my heart is this idea of being able to build on other people's successes, you know, like imagine if the guitar was patented and no one could use it, like that would be horrible, you know? And, and for so long, like, I think that on some level we're too tight with ideas. Like there should be some sort of remediation. There's be some sort of, you know, changes in laws for intellectual property on some level. I think people that make stuff, they definitely deserve it, but you should be able to build on some things on some level, like maybe after 20 years or there's got to be some kind of change in there because I think that stifles innovation in a lot of ways. What would you agree with that? Well, I mean, it's you're kind of speaking to the whole, uh, you know, there was a whole movement that started back with uh, a lot of companies, Mozilla, you know, kind of first and foremost, this whole like for uh for a an open source, right? Right. Where right. it's like there's no owner of 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 this, and it's kind of the way a lot of the the a lot of platforms, a lot of the blockchain, you know, is kind yeah. of becomes like you know, there's no centralized right. owner of a lot of these different technologies, um, and a lot of these things are you know, here's the here's the open source way to kind of tap into this, and right. So I'm I'm definitely a believer that that's a there's definitely uh, that's that's definitely beneficial overall. Um, I I do think look the intellectual property is it's it's a challenging one for me because you know run, having right. been involved in music and having represented artists over the years, um, you know there look I think if you created a piece of art uh, and, and a music music work you should be able to control what that's used for right so i do think that there is some you know because look there's a reason why right um it's like if i don't want my music to be used for that to promote whatever it is that product or that right a person or that movement or whatever right. it may be then you should be able to if it's your work then you should be able to to control that so it's a little bit of a of a back and forth. So what you're starting to see, like, I don't know if you saw this recently, but um, for the first time, Mickey Mouse went into yeah. public domain. It's just Steamboat Willie. It's just the original, original. It's not. And, you know, literally like the next day, there was like a slasher horror film that came out with the guy using the Steamboat Willie, like, you know, mask as the, uh, um, as the, as the, as the slasher, you know? And so, it's 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 interesting because i i think as a as a creative executive i think it's important that we 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 have the ability to continue to build on what's already there 
Yeah. Um, but also as someone who's worked directly with creatives, I see the importance of being able to have some level of control as to how your creative work is used. I don't have, I'm not smart enough guy to know where the, where the answer is. Um, you know, I think the statute of limitations is one. It's like, look, after a certain period of time, you're not talking about the artist anymore. You're talking about <laughs> the artists, like grandchildren, right? right. Who, uh, who are now controlling this. So at, at what point should things go into public domain? Um, and, you know, I do think there is a point where, where it does make sense for that. You know, I love the fact that I can get certain books for free, right? Because yeah. they're public domain now. Um, and so at what point is an idea, you know, not fully controlled by that origin, the originator of that idea anymore. And uh, I think that's probably a whole nother, you know, we can have a whole other podcast session yeah, probably totally. on a particular subject because uh, it could. can get pretty deep. We could. Keith, this is awesome, man. I, I love talking to people and just getting to dig into their minds a little bit and see what makes them tick. And it's always so rewarding to me to get to meet new people and find an affinity with them and like learn new things, man. And I feel like this conversation did that, man. I'm really stoked to meet you and get to have this conversation. I hope we can have more of them and maybe we can bring more people into the tent and make our voices even louder together in the future, man. But before I let you go, where can people find you? What do you got coming up and what are you excited about? Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, so I have been spending a lot of time on LinkedIn has been really my platform and I post there uh, regularly and I respond to my my DMs there. So if you just kind of look for, you know, Keith Huffman on LinkedIn, that's the best way to find out more about me and to contact me. And what I'm excited about, so I mentioned Language Hub, that's something I'm definitely uh, very excited about. Yeah. And then I'd say also, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about what's what's going to happen next in the cannabis industry because uh i've been involved in that industry now for uh almost 10 years and um i it's been it's been it's been you know sort of artificially held back for so long because of just you know these ridiculous you know laws and, and regulations that were put in for you know all the wrong reasons you know based on you know um just you know lot you know at the end of the day you know to protect you know existing industries that you know that you know hemp the plant you know and, and cannabis medicine uh got in the way of you know and and we're we're you know and so that evil you know the whole like you know going back to the whole like you know journalism days of william randall first and all those different you know different things i feel like we're at this point this inflection point where things are ready to turn. The people want it. 70% of Americans want legal cannabis. Our politicians have not been listening to us. But I feel like this is a year where we could finally get that tipping point. So that's the other thing that I'm excited about because I, I feel like cannabis is finally ready to kind of have its moment where um, it's going to be uh, really readily accessible to the people the way that it would be. And I'm looking for 2024 to be that year. Yeah. I'm hopeful to see an explosion in creativity and music the same way that we got these incredible bands out of the 60s. I'm hopeful that the legalization and the normalization of cannabis and plant medicines will spur upon this new creativity flow of music and festivals and creativity that just launches into the world. And I, I know you're, I know you've got to go, but uh, Clint Kyle's is saying great conversation, fellas. Clint Kyle's great podcaster. And I don't know if you know this, Clint, but Keeve is for 2024. He wants to get out there and be on more podcasts, you know, so reach out to him, Clint. He's an awesome <laughs> guy. And uh, to everybody listening, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. An incredible show, incredible guest. Uh, Keep hanging on briefly afterwards. I'll speak to you. But to everybody today, I really appreciate your time. Everyone have a beautiful day. Aloha. Peace out.